Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Carol Iman and I'm the library's outreach and uh, marketing librarian. Tonight our program is sponsored by the Friends of the Library and I want to tell you about a couple of events that the, that the Friends have coming up. This Saturday on August 22nd from 10 to 2, the Friends will hold a pop-up book sale. It'll be outside on the Library Plaza. The books available will be adult fiction and fiction and nonfiction for children. The prices are very reasonable, just a dollar or two, and kids' books are less, some of them are less than that. Um, the sale will be cash only, and don't forget to wear your mask. Also, author Jamie Ford will be doing a virtual event hosted by the Friends of the Library. That's on Sunday, October 11th. Jamie is the author of Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, which is the 2020 Nashua Reed selection. Um, be sure to check out a copy before his visit. We have like 100 copies, so you shouldn't have any trouble getting one. And then read it and talk about it with your friends, your family, your neighbors, your book group, and invite them to join you for the virtual event. You do want to register for that event too. To get the details on how to do that, go to nashuareads.com. So I have a few housekeeping things to announce about using Zoom. Um, note that all the audience members are muted tonight so we can decrease background noise. Also, audience members will only be able to see the video of the speakers. If you're having technical difficulties, please use the raise hand function. To access it, you go to the participants button, which you can see if um, usually at the bottom of the screen, sometimes at the top. And then in the in the participants box, you'll see a function for raise hand. Um, Weston, the library's IT coordinator, will monitor that and he'll try to help you out. You can also use the chat function if you want to talk to other members of the audience during the program. And for questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and type in your questions. What we're going to do is let our guests speak first and then at the end we'll take your questions. But you can type them in any time. If you find that this, at the, box, the speaker's video box is obscuring his slides, you can just drag and, and move that over to the side and you should be able to see them better. And I do want to let you know that tonight's event is being recorded for future viewing. If you're interested in purchasing books by tonight's guest, um, he'll tell you how to do so at the end of the talk. And we'll also, we've already put his email addresses in the chat. Um, you can use those to order books. So our speaker tonight is best known as a journalist for Boston's Chronicle. While he appears in the Chronicle studio at the anchor desk or delivering commentary, it's out in the field that he's best known to viewers. From every corner of New England, he's found the offbeat, the unique, the moving, and the just plain memorable, all while telling the colorful stories of the region's people and places. Politics is also a passion, and he files a weekly report for WCVB's political roundtable on the record. He has written three books, a New England notebook on one reporter, six states, uncommon stories, Wicked Pissed, New England's most famous feuds, and the one you see here, New England's General Stores, Exploring an American Classic. Please join me to welcome Ted Reinstein. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for joining me tonight. You know, it's a beautiful night outside, as you may know. I was, I was walking my dog just about an hour ago and I thought, wow, I would much rather have, um, have had the original plan and uh, have been in Nashua with all of you tonight uh, in person but uh, hopefully this will do. So I'm gonna talk to you not tonight about, uh, about my third book, but also uh, it happens to be one of, uh, one of the things that I love most in all my traveling around New England, which is general stores. I'm gonna start with, um, oddly enough, um, some Latin. Um, so that is Latin for the dodo bird. Um, and you are looking at uh, a, a, an endangered species that was uh, was brought to complete extinction. You will not find, as you probably know, a dodo bird on the face of Mother Earth anywhere today. Now, this is an example of a presently 
endangered species, but one not yet fully extinct. And so is this. Uh, if there are any Latin scholars out there, I apologize. Um, I, I can't vouch for the Latin for General Store, but I did my best. Um, and this one is in New Hampshire. This is the Harrisville General Store. If any of you have ever been there, you know what a wonderful general store it is. And by the way, it makes one of the best BLTs I've ever tasted. Now, general stores we've established um, are endangered species. This, what you're looking at now, another iconic New England creation, the diner, also was once an endangered species, less so today which is why I call it a hopeful sign for general stores. Why? Because the same thing that saved the diner, I believe is now saving general stores. And it has nothing to do with food. And for general stores, it has nothing to do with a single thing you'll find on a single shelf in a single general store in a single town in America. It has everything to do with a different word, community. <clears throat> because what people found when diners began to disappear, and you had the rise of the fast food restaurants coast to coast throughout America, and you could buy a hamburger on the highway for 19, 20 cents, right? In the late 50s. What people found after the newness wore off, after the fact of this new gimmick wore off of fast food anywhere, people felt that there was something they missed about that mom and pop eatery on Main Street or the diner in town. And what it was, again, had nothing to do with food. In fact, you had to pay more generally for a hamburger at a diner locally than you would at McDonald's. In 1958, you could get a hamburger at McDonald's for 19 cents. So it wasn't the food, it was community. It was community. It was a sense that if you went in to a fast food restaurant anywhere USA on the highway, granted, you could get a hamburger for 19 cents and you also were never going to see anybody you knew. And people, started to feel over time, you know, there is something, it's a, it's a value added. It's a deep value added. The fact that you feel like when you go into a local place to eat, um, a diner, you tend to see people from your community. And that's what saved the diner. That's what I believe it is that we're going to talk about here tonight, I think will help save the general store. So back to the dodo bird. <laughs> so here you're looking at an artist's depiction of um, what it looked like uh, for predators to hunt the dodo to complete extinction. Now, when it comes to the type of predators that have been, shall we say, not hunting, but driving the general store to what has seemed sometimes like certain extinction, I'm going to tell you right now that none of our hands are clean. Okay, you may have consorted with one of these predators recently. I have in just the past, what's today, Tuesday? So the past 48 hours, I have consorted, I am big enough to admit, with one of these predators. Maybe you have too. Right, the big box store. The big box store is spelled big trouble for general stores. But there's a reason why I'm showing these very modern iterations of these two big box stores. And the reason is the big box store did not begin to spell the demise of the general store. The general store began to slide toward what looked like certain extinction more than half a century before the rise of the big box stores. In fact, when the general store first was threatened with what looked like certain extinction, Sam Walton, who founded Walmarts, was still running things out of a single store in Missouri. That was more than half a century ago. Now, I like the point, believe it or not, um, and here we are, it, you know, we're, we're connected with a wonderful library. And by the way, I should have said right off the bat how thankful I am to the friends of the National Public Library for having me tonight. Having said that, here we are looking at one of the greats of American literature, John Steinbeck. And the reason why I like to point to John Steinbeck in talking about general stores is that John Steinbeck is a little bit in our story tonight like the canary in the coal mine. You may recall that in 1960, John Steinbeck with his best friend, Charlie, pictured here, set out from his home in Sag Harbor, New York, in a custom built GMC pickup with a camper in the back that he nicknamed Rosinante, and they circumnavigated America. He drove around America and that became his book, Travels with Charlie. Now, Steinbeck loved small town America. 
Yes, he also traveled through big cities, but he loved small town America. And he was driving through all these small towns all over America right at the time that they started, these general stores started to disappear. And Steinbeck, a wonderful journalist, an incredibly observant, perceptive writer, he didn't miss it. So as you can see, this is from Travels with Charlie, and this is what Steinbeck noticed, that the big towns were getting bigger, the villages smaller, and all those wonderful little stores, whatever kind they were, the haberdashers, the hardware stores, the general stores, they were beginning to disappear. 1962, Travels with Charlie. Now, when Steinbeck was growing up, as you see here in Salinas, California, this was a scene that was instantly recognizable to pretty much virtually every American. At that time in 1900, um, you probably were in a store much like this at least once or twice a week, if only to grab some essentials, some necessities. Um, and 50 years before this, you would have been in a place like that several times a week. It would have been the only place uh, to buy anything essentially that you needed. Now, if we go 50 years out from when this picture was taken in 1900, completely game-changing event in American culture. By 1956, a majority of Americans for the first time in American history owned an automobile. And that had implications for virtually every facet of American life, from the way that people carried on relationships, from how they went about finding jobs or moving to other jobs, deciding where they lived, deciding if they wanted to move. All of that changed, including commerce in America. So obviously that's going to affect the general store. And if you go 20, 25 years out from when this picture was taken, now you have the mushrooming of the interstate highway system. And again, solely because of the automobile, now life changes all over America. And you have people now living in small towns that Steinbeck was driving through where he was noticing the little general stores beginning to disappear. And if you're in one of those small towns now, as late as the 70s, and this is the little local store, where you go to buy whatever it is you might need during the week. And now you, for the first time, have a car parked outside your driveway and you can go an exit or two in the interstate and you can get to this kind of choice. So if this is what you're offering locally, a little tough to compete with this, right? But a funny thing happened on the way to extinction because, you know, again, solely because of the automobile, life changes coast to coast in terms of the look of America's communities. Yes, you still have the cities. It's the suburbs. It's the areas around the cities where life is beginning to change, where life begins to look different, where neighborhoods begin to change. Many of those small little general stores and diners, they begin to go away. Sometimes they begin to go away in favor of what we're looking at here. Huge tract housing these track developments, coast to coast. This is California, but you know, this is repeated coast to coast right through to New England. And believe it or not, and these people, by the way, these are essentially, this is starting in sort of the mid to late seventies. It really picks up. These are the children of the greatest generation. These are the boomers starting families of their own. And in many cases, these huge new suburban communities People are living in homes. I mean, look at them. They're living in homes that are two, three, four, five times the square footage of homes they grew up in, that their parents grew up in. Uh, they often have wonderful amenities, great recreational programs and all kinds of things. And in the morning, you know, you, you're driving by two or three different huge strip malls and you can stop anywhere you want for your coffee and your breakfast in the morning. And yet, and yet, in spite of all this newness and all this great new stuff, that these huge new communities and neighborhoods offer, there were a lot of people that were actually missing something, right? Missing anything. You know what it was? Back to that word again. It was community. It was community. You know, in 1973, Life Magazine published a survey, a survey in which they asked people how much contact they had with their next door neighbor, neighbors. And a majority, clear majority of people, 63% of Americans said they had little to no contact with their next door neighbor. And a lot of people found that, I think understandably, disturbing. The bottom line is neighborhoods were beginning to change. 
neighborhoods were beginning to go away. They were beginning to undergo huge change that had never been seen before in American history. And that sense of community, that sense of knowing who your neighbors are, that sense of interacting more with your neighbors, that was going away. And part of the reason that was going away is that these places where we interact with our neighbors, diners, general stores, public libraries, they were going away. And this was of particular interest to one singular American who I think often deserves more attention than he gets because he coined the phrase you're looking at, which is the phrase that describes every one of those iconic places I just listed, I just named, libraries, diners, general stores, the third place in American life. His name's Ray Oldenburg. He's a former sociologist at the University of, uh, of Florida. And um, he spent a decade researching how it was that American communities were changing. What was being lost, if anything was being lost? What was it? How much would it be missed? And in 1989, he published the results of his finding in a wonderful book called The Great Good Place. Cafes, coffee shop, bookstores, bars, hair salons, and other hangouts at the heart of a community, all of which were going away. And he coined this term because what he found was, Ray Oldenburg, which, Seems simple now. In fact, when I show you, when I show you this little diagram now, you're going to say, well, I know that. Ah, nobody really did know that before Ray Oldenburg did the research, because what he found was, in spite of how free as a bird we like to think we are as Americans, right? In spite of how much we travel, the trips we take, what Ray Oldenburg found was, we spent, still spend the vast majority of our lives in one of just three places. The first place, you can probably guess, home, family. The second place, you can probably also guess, work, right? It's the third place nobody had ever put their finger on before. And the third place, as Ray Oldenburg spelled it out, is not one single place. A third place in American life can be many different kinds of places, as we were just saying, right? A third place can be a diner, a general store, a, a public library, a place where you get your hair done, uh, it could be a place of worship. It could, it could be a local bar, right? Because at Cheers, they really did know your name, for real, right? That's the place they were trying to refer to. And these places were going away. And what Ray Oldenburg was really calling kind of a, a alarm about was that he wanted people to understand that these places weren't just like, luxuries. They weren't just things that were just nice. They were places that when they go away, we will miss them. We take them for granted, Ray Oldenburg warned, at our peril, because they leave a hole, as he put it, in a community when they go away. And you know, we talked about a moment ago that people in those big, big track developments, right? Right there, right? Right. So they were missing that sense of community. A lot of people were missing that. And by the time you get to the late 70s and 80s, a lot, look, I don't mean it was one of history's great mass migrations, but thousands of people who are now starting families of their own really felt like they wanted to have more of a sense of community like they had experienced when they were growing up and they moved. They moved. Thousands of people moved to smaller towns all around New England where they found that sense of community. They found those third places. They found that not only did they still exist, but they were still thriving in places like Barnard, Vermont. The Barnard General Store was the same community gathering place as you see here in 1940, as it was on Friday night sing-alongs in 1985, as it was in 2005 when they added the ice cream counter in the back of the store, and as it was just four years ago when I dropped in to say hello to the brand new owners of the store, Jillian Bradley and Joe Minerva. So there's this sense of continuity in these smaller towns. And this is great. This is good. And by the way, a lot of these boomers who moved to these small towns, they walked the walk. They didn't just talk the talk. And a lot of them ended up buying. It's uncanny. A lot of boomers ended up, when these stores went up for sale, a lot of them bought these general stores to keep them going. So that's good, right? Now you get 20 years later, 
So now we're up in our story to like the late 90s, in and around 2000. And now some of those boomers who had helped save these stores are themselves getting up in age, are themselves thinking about retiring. Maybe they, they want to just take some time and do some things and travel and they want to find somebody to run the store. They certainly want to keep the store going. They feel strongly about that problem. The economy by the late 90s, as you may recall, um, not good. Nobody was buying general stores. And as much as a lot of these folks who owned the stores at that time, as much as they wanted to find someone who would buy the store and keep the store going, wasn't happening. And a whole wave of general stores all across New England in the late 90s through the early 2000s closed. And now it really did look like this might be the end of the general store. After all, they'd weathered a lot, and now it seemed like nobody wanted to buy them, nobody wanted to keep them going. Nobody could. Nobody, nobody had that kind of disposable income in a crushing recession. And a whole wave of them closed. It looks like that's really it. And you know, I think that really would have been it. Or at least I always say, I think if it weren't for one single general store right there in New Hampshire, I was going to say right here, but I'm not in New Hampshire tonight, but probably most, many of you are. And it was one small general store in New Hampshire that really, in a sense, saved the day for general stores because sometimes, cliche aside, it really does take a village. And it did in South Ackworth, New Hampshire. If you don't know where South Ackworth is, um, and I'd look at a map later, um, it is in, we were, we were talking about it just before we, we started here, actually. It's in the hill country of uh, central New Hampshire, kind of south central New Hampshire, in and around Westmoreland, Marlow, um, Alstead. And South Ackworth has always had a wonderful old general store. Uh, it's been there for 175 years. Here it is in 1910. Um, there's stories of civil war soldiers returning to the Granite State from service in the Civil War and stopping off at the, at the South Ackworth General Store and having a free meal. But by the time you get to 2000, again, because of the economic situation that was part of the country at that time, the owners who owned it for over 30 years, which is two lifetimes in a general, for most general store owners, couldn't run it anymore. They couldn't run it anymore. They were desperate to find a buyer, couldn't find a buyer, and the store was forced to close. But the folks in South Ackworth were determined to save their store. And they came together to do something that had never been done when it came to general stores. They couldn't find a single buyer to save the general store. So instead, they bought it themselves. Had never been done. They formed a co-op. They formed a co-op along the, the lines of like a food co-op, right? You put in X amount of hours a week working in the store and you get X amount of discount on your groceries. And it took off. People bought shares far and wide, well from outside of South Ackworth. They created a cafe inside to bring in more revenue. They created a pizza oven out in the back to bring in more revenue. They started having these wonderful chef dinners to bring in more revenue, and it worked. It worked. Today, the South Ackworth Village store is thriving like never before. I hope the lights don't go out there anytime soon. They offered a template for what other towns could do to save their store. Had never been done. So hats off to South Ackworth, New Hampshire. Now, going next door now, right? A little bit west of Vermont, West Roosbury, Vermont, a different take on a community coming together to save their store. Because in South Ac in, in Shrewsbury, Vermont, they not only had to find a way to save the store after it closed down, then they had to stand up to mother nature, as you will see, in a very big way. Now, when this picture was taken, Marjorie Pierce, standing here with her sister, had already owned the store. Her family, the Pierces, had already owned the store for almost 100 years. But at this point, she's in her mid to late 70s. Doing the math now, you go 20 years further, and in the 90s, 1990, she is in her mid-90s, can't run the store anymore. Just like in South Ackworth, tries so hard to find someone to run the store. She wants so much to be able to keep the store going. Can't do it. Store closes. Town crushed. This is their third place. 
This is Shrewsbury's third place. This is where people gather. This is where people come together. This is where you run into a friend you haven't seen for a long time. And it was now closed. And Marjorie Pierce felt terrible, but nothing the poor, the poor woman was 96 years old, not much she could do about it. And she wasn't going to be able to, to keep running it. But she did go to a friend of hers, who happens to be one of my favorite New Englanders. Sadly, we lost him last year, um, Paul Brune. Paul Brune was the executive director and the creator of the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And what the Preservation Trust of Vermont did in a really pioneering way, they started doing what they do in Vermont. Today, they do it all over America. They help cities and towns hold on to their history. And by history, I mean a historic shopping district, a main street, a, an old music hall, um, a diner, a store. Um, and they help towns raise money, find loans, write grants, and hold on to these pieces of history. Now, when Marjorie Pierce called up her friend Paul Brun, she, she, she really wasn't one talking about, you know, the, the ins and outs of saving history, which she wanted was something much more direct. Uh, and she said to Paul, she said, Paul, I need to talk to you. So Paul, being the kind of guy he is, jumped in his beat up Prius and he drove down from Burlington, down to Shrewsbury there, and he met her at the store. And she said, Paul, I need to reopen the stoa. And Paul said, how are you going to do that, Marge? And she said, I'm not going to do what you are. And he said, I don't understand. And she said, I'm going to give you the stoa, Ninny. And I'm going to give you $10,000, which is pretty much all the money I have, but I don't expect to need it too much, Mawa. Well, Paul, uh, gracious gentleman that he is, certainly thanked Marjorie Pierce for her incredible generosity. But he had to point out to Marge that the Preservation Trust of Vermont could in no way accept her offer, that they were a nonprofit that helped cities and towns themselves take ownership of these historic properties and that the Preservation Trust owned no properties outright themselves. To which Marjorie Pierce said, piffle. Well, they went, according to Paul, back and forth like that for about another 30 minutes or so. But uh, 30 minutes or so later, Paul was back in his beat up Prius, making his way back up to Burlington. And you may not be surprised to find out that the Preservation Trust owned its first piece of property outright. Uh, as Paul said to me, um, he said, you try to say no to, no to Marjorie Pierce when she's in a fettle. So about a week and a half later, Paul Brun came back down to Shrewsbury, where he met these folks on the front porch of the store, and they were the local historical society. And he told them that, uh, he said, you know, I, I, I take it you've heard by now that uh, uh, the Preservation Trust has ownership of the store. Uh, I hold the deed to the store, uh, but I'm not going to run the store. And they said, well, who is? And he said, you are. And they were aghast. You know, these are Vermonters. They're, they were farmers. They're artisans. They're craftspeople. Uh, they're cheesemakers. Um, they said, what do we know about running a store? And he had to reassure them, which he has done before. And he reassured them that he's done this before. And uh, it'll be fun, he said. It'll be like going back to school. We'll, you'll have a little homework. We'll take field trips. You'll learn how to outfit a store. You'll learn how to do inventory and order product. They learned how to completely renovate 200 year old general store. And I think they did a pretty fine job. I don't know what you think, but I think that's, that, that looks so good. I always joke, it looks like the, the set that a Hollywood set designer would come up with uh, for the set of an old New England general store, right? Uh, they did all that and they reopened the store. They reopened the store with a brand new generator. Story behind that is key because um, it didn't go off without a hitch, you know, getting to the point of reopening the store. After all, this is a, a town of only just under 800 people, uh, sometimes ornery New Englanders, uh, where it's hard sometimes to find consensus, uh, especially where money is involved. And, uh, uh, you know, when they got to the point of close to opening, the, uh, the, the, the historical folks who were running the store came back before the town and they said, we need some more money. Uh, they said, you know, um, if we are going to upgrade and modernize the store and be kind of a new breed of general store, uh, we need an emergency generator. Um, 
because we feel that now we need to have Wi-Fi and the community needs to know that we will be open no matter what, no matter what a Vermont winter throws at us, we will be open. And there was a lot of belly aching, you know, Marjorie Pierce never needed a generator, you know, but they got the generator. They opened the store in 2009. It was great. People were just so happy in Shrewsbury for two years. Now, remember, I did say that here in Shrewsbury, Vermont, they had to come together as a community to save the store. Then they had to stand up to Mother Nature in order to keep it open. So in 2011, as you may recall, Hurricane Irene barreled up the East Coast and then it made an extraordinarily unusual turn northwest for the Green Mountains. And it barreled into Vermont and the power went out all over Vermont. The storm blew out, blew away, covered bridges from north to south, east, west, all over Vermont. The power went out all over Vermont, including little Shrewsbury, Vermont, except one little spot. Because in Shrewsbury, Vermont, thanks to that little emergency generator, the folks trooped over through the howling rain and the flying debris, and they fired up that emergency generator, and the lights came on, and people came like zombies out of the woods and, and they, they gathered at the store as that's just what was supposed to happen. And they were able to get on Wi-Fi and they were able to tell relatives that everything was okay. And they were able to have some hot coffee and community chatter. And nobody has ever belly ached about the emergency generator ever again. Now, at this point in our story, we're now actually up to the mid 2000s. The national economy now is doing much better, right? And so there are people now all over New England that when a general store is set to close or looks like it might be lost in their community, there are folks now who are actually able to say, honey, I bought the store. My favorite case of a honey, I bought the store involves, I always like to say, possibly the single most unlikely general store owner in America, Steve Carell bona fide Hollywood celebrity, actor, comedian, wonderfully funny guy. Um, Steve Carell, if you've ever watched The Office, right, when it was on, you may, well, probably better known as the world's worst boss. But Steve Carell grew up in Acton, Massachusetts, just less than 30 minutes from where I'm sitting right now. And when he was growing up, there was a general store in Acton, Massachusetts. It's long gone, unfortunately, now. But when I spoke with Steve Carell for the book, he told me this was a place that he was enthralled with when he was a kid. It was a place that he was able to, allowed to go to on his bicycle all by himself. First place that he was ever, ever allowed to go all by himself with his own little allowance money and buy penny candy at the general store. You know, unfortunately, this is one of the moments of my book talk for this, this book that I'm not able to do really now because I, I can't see any of you. But what I love about this point in the talk is I, I love to ask people, how many of you share the same experience as Steve Carell, as me, and a little local store was the first place you were allowed to go all by yourself to buy candy? It was absolutely my, my experience. I grew up to the east of here, right on Boston Harbor, little town of Winthrop, Massachusetts. And uh, there was a little store and it was the first place I was allowed to go just like Steve Carell and buy candy at the store. And the same was true of Steve's lovely wife, Nancy. Nancy grew up on the South shore of Massachusetts and um, in Hingham. And she had the same experience. She and her older sister, Tish, used to go next door on hot summer nights to Mansfield, uh, Marshfield, excuse me, Marshfield. And, uh, and there was a little general store there, still is, which we're going to get to. And, um, and they would buy candy or ice cream at the store. Now, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, um, Nancy's big sister, Tish, went out west to Hollywood over Christmas time to visit her little sister and her famous brother-in-law. And while she was there, she told her sister, Nancy, that guess what? The Mans Marsh, I keep wanting to say Mansfield. There is a general store in Mansfield. It's also in the book, but we're talking about the Marshfield general store, which is next door to Hingham. And she said, the Marshfield general store is up for sale. And Nancy said, who do you think is gonna buy it? And Tish said, uh, maybe no one. 
and she held up an old copy of the globe, kind of ratty copy of the globe that she had brought with her on the flight to LA. And in it, there was a story that said a local developer was fixing to buy the store and develop it into condos. And at that moment, Steve Carell said he overheard this and he went into the, the kitchen where they were sitting. And long story short, when Nancy's sister Tish returned east that Christmas time, she had with her a blank check with which to purchase the Marshfield General Store. And it really is a historic general store. And, uh, you know, it, it, during the Civil War, speaking of the Civil War, during the Civil War, if you look at the top floor there, that little dormer, um, they stitched Union Army uniforms on the top floor of the store during the Civil War. Today, it's one of the few remaining general stores that still has a working post office attached to it. Uh, used to be the case with all general stores. And I think the Corrells and their design team did a wonderful job of maintaining the historical integrity, as you'll see, of the Marshfield Hills General Store. And Steve Corral made his sister-in-law, Tish Vivada, a general store. There she is uh, with her, with her brother-in-law. And she runs it today. And today the Corrells own a house on the South Shore. They come out here every summer. They may be here now for all I know. And uh, these days, no summer in the area is complete without a confirmed owner sighting at his general store. Now we have been talking so far about saving the general store. Why? Because that's what the first part of the general store story is all about. It's about coming to a period by the time you get to the later 19th century, 20th century, where these stores were beginning to disappear. So the stories were all about how they were saved. But now at this point in our story, many of these stores are being saved. And I thought as I was putting this book together that it was only fair to pay some homage, if you'll permit me a fancy French word, to point out some stores and share some stories of some stores that have never needed saving. They are what I call tried and true. These are stores that are completely interwoven into the communities where they exist. They're really part of the fabric of these communities. I'll share one with you, one of my favorites, um, the Warren store in Warren, Vermont. So Warren is up in kind of ski country. If you've ever been there, it's kind of equidistant between Waitsfield, uh, Warren, it's uh, kind of uh, the uh, Mad River Glen, uh, Green Mountains, the western edge of the Green Mountains. So it's mountainous, uh, a lot of skiing. It's, a, it's really a wonderful store. It has been there for over a 200 years, the late 1700s. Here it is in the early 1940s. And it really is in many ways just the kind of quintessential New England general store. Uh, I was last up at the Warren store, uh, I distinctly remember, just over four years ago. And the reason I remember is that it was at that time, here we are in a presidential election season once again. But I was up there during primary season in uh, 20, early 2016. And um, I dropped in to say hello to Jack Garvin, uh, my friend Jack, who owns the store. And I said, uh, so Jack, what's new? And he said, oh, what's new? What's new? What's new? Oh, he said, this is new. He said, we are having a contest right now to name the wood stove. Now, I know that sounds like, wow, um, not the most earth shattering news. But the thing is, the, the wood stove at the Warren store, as you'll see, is not your average wood stove. It's as tall as a person. It's kind of the defining physical characteristic of the store. And they were having a contest to name it. And I said, well, you have any, uh, you have any good uh, candidates uh, for a name yet? And Jack said, how funny you should use that word, Ted. I said, why? He said, well, he explained. It turns out that about a week before I'd been in, another longtime friend of the store had dropped in to say hi to Jack. Um, rather a famous Vermonter in his own right. In fact, I was surprised that he was back in Vermont at that time because he was pretty busy. So I don't know if he was back in Vermont just catching up or doing some laundry back in Burlington. But at any event, he dropped into the store. Jack told him about the contest, obviously quicker on his feet than I was. He said, I have an idea. And he threw out his idea for the name for the wood stove and they liked it and he won. Bernie Sanders won the stove naming contest at the Warren store. And you know, it's funny because just about here we are at the political convention time again, right? So it was just about this time four years ago that Bernie Sanders did not win in his quest 
to, to, to get the Democratic presidential nomination. And I have to say, I always wondered if in his quiet moments during his time of disappointment there in August 2016, if he ever took some small consolation, you know, in the fact that unlike Hillary, he won the stove naming contest at the Warren store. I don't know. I, I would have been screaming that from the, the rooftops, but Bernie uh, preferred to talk more about income inequality. That's Bernie. Um, one of a kind is one of my favorite chapters in the book because it really combines a little bit of everything. These stores that are one of a kind have never been up for sale. They are tried and true. And they also, each of them has something that is so peculiar, so distinct and unique about them that, well, they are one of a kind and they needed their own chapter. I'm gonna share with you real quick one. As long as we're in Vermont, we'll stay here for a moment. Norwich, Vermont. So Norwich, Vermont, uh, if you're not familiar with it, Norwich is, uh, to place it for you, the upper, think of the upper valley area of New Hampshire, right? So Dartmouth, Hanover, right? So way over on kind of getting toward the northwest side there, right on the Connecticut River. If you go just across the Connecticut River from Hanover, you're in Norwich, Vermont. And there you will find Dan and Witt's. Now, Dan and Witt uh, were not the original owners of the store. Dan and Witt were actually high school buddies in Norwich, Vermont. In the 1930s, they worked at the store, both of them uh, became good friends, obviously were, were pretty good at helping out at the store. And by the 1950s, they owned it. Really, apparently from everything I've read, and folks I've talked to, uh, smart guys, really good at marketing. And uh, they came up with all kinds of little promotions and they hung this sign, which you've probably, I don't know if they were the first to use it, but they certainly made much of it, right? If we don't have it, you don't need it. I bet you've seen that uh, elsewhere. Um, and they wanted to expand, right? They wanted to expand. Problem was, they had very little area to expand into, okay? Uh, to the right of the store where that guy's walking um, is the Norwich Inn. Can't expand there. To the left on the other side, is a park, can expand there, street in front. So their only option for expansion was to expand directly behind the store in about a three quarters of an acre lot. That's a lot of room for a store, if you think about it, right? And that's what they did. So what makes Dan and Witt so unique is that when you walk into the store, this is what you see. Not that big, it's small. It has that kind of cluttered, claustrophobic feel of a quintessential New England general store. And from where those, that guy and his son are standing, from the front door, which is where I took the picture, is only about maybe 40 feet. Not, not any more than that. But if you go to the left on the screen, from where they are, to that Cabot, kind of that checkerboard, uh, buffalo plaid refrigerator there, you can't see, but behind that is the butcher counter. And behind the butcher counter, there's a door. There's no sign on the door, there's no door. But if you walk through there, you're in a very different place. You're in the back. And the back does not resemble a quintessential <laughs> general store. In fact, the back resembles more a big box store, believe it or not. I mean, check it out, look at the, look at the ceiling, you can see what I mean, right? Um, this feels like a big box store and you can get lost back there. It's just a maze of aisles and stuff everywhere. They claim there's some system to where everything is put. I don't believe it for a minute, and neither will you. If you've been in there, I'm sure you'd agree. Um, so the first time I was back there, it was a late winter afternoon, about, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years ago. And uh, I was back there with Dan Frazier, who's the original Dan's uh, grandson. And uh, he needed to go back out front. They were shorthanded. He said, you know, feel free to keep looking around. I did. After about 10 minutes, um, I, I started to make my way back out to the front, or I should say, I attempted to make my way back out to the front. The problem was I was lost. Um, uh, I, I, everywhere I went, and you know how like if you've ever been lost in a building or like, you know, you, you find maybe you're on the wrong floor, it's like you start walking, you start walking really fast and you make sure nobody's looking to see that you're walking really fast. And I still didn't find my way out. I finally found my way out. I got out to the front and I said to Dan, I said, Dan, I just got lost in the back. And he was basically like, big whoop, 
I was like, what, what, really? He said, oh, pff, please. He said, it happens all the time. I said, really? He said, oh, all the time. So it turns out it does happen all the time. And they have allowed for this uh, uh, unfortunate occurrence uh, at, at Dan and Woods by, um, by creating what I can only describe as the commercial equivalent of the ski patrol, right? So you know at a ski area, uh, when, when the ski area closes at the end of the day, depending on the season and the light, right? Any time from like uh, 3.34 in, in early winter to more like 4.35, you know, when you get more light in the spring, when, when, when the lifts close to the public, then the ski patrol goes up and they come down every single trail, every single slope, and they flush out every trail, every slope to make sure, God forbid, you know, nobody's left behind after dark. Closing time, nine o'clock, every night at Dan and Witz, they send a flusher out to the back and make sure nobody's left behind. So Dan's telling me this, and I said, well, Dan, that's very um, civic-minded of you, but I said, come on, nine o'clock on a bitter cold January night, in Norwich, Vermont, are you telling me you actually have to flush people out of the back? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, come on. He said, oh, yeah. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah. He said, let me tell you something. He said, I would say at least once a week, every night, we'll go back there, and there'll be some, like, 11-year-old kid wandering around. I said, Dan, that's not so good. He said, you know, it's really not so good. He said, half the time we know for a fact their parents left like an hour ago. That really is not so good. Um, my other favorite, one of a kind, is in Windsor, Maine. Haven't talked about Maine. We're going to talk about it twice in the remaining few minutes here. Um, Windsor, Maine, similar story in some way to Dan and Whit, because um, Hussey was a, uh, a, Harlan Hussey was a German immigrant in Windsor, Maine, and he created a little general store, just like Dan and Witz, it was a, it was, it was, it, it, yeah, actually, unlike Dan and Witz, it was a one story, small garage like general store. And same time period, all through the 30s, 40s, 50s, did very well, just like Dan and Witz wanted to expand, just like Dan and Witt was somewhat limited in terms of physically how he could expand. His only option, he couldn't go in any direction on the same level. So his only option was to expand vertically. So he did. You're saying doesn't look any different? Oh, it is. So three stories, huge basement level that you can't see, ground floor level, and second floor level. So if you're wondering what makes Huzzies so unique, it is this. Huzzies is unique, in fact, in all the world, in that it sells something in combination that no other general store in America sells. Now, when you walk into Huzzies, you can imagine if you were going to walk into Huzzies and all you wanted was, say, a lamp wick or a pair of boot laces, you wouldn't want to have to travel through three floors covered with stuff. It's like three football fields of stuff, right? So they help you out. When you walk in, there's a huge guide sign that points out where every single department, every single thing you might want to find is. So if you start reading this sign, I'm going to show you now, if you start reading it at the bottom, I think you will come to on your own what it is they sell in combination that doesn't seem to belong there, right? So you walk in, you say, okay, this looks perfectly natural. Wood stoves, home and garden, plumbing, electrical paint, hardware, camping gear, fishing, hunting supplies, guns, bridal gowns, cold. whoa, what? Right, bridal gowns. Huzzies in Little Windsor, Maine is, as far as the research shows, the only general store in America that sells the combination of guns, gowns, and beer. This sign has been on Letterman. In fact, all kidding aside, Harlan Huzzy's granddaughter, Kristen Valentine, this is from her wedding day, had some fun with the sign. And there is the lovely bride with the groom, and uh, she is holding a six pack of Schlitz and her wedding bouquet, and the groom is holding a brand new 12 gauge. Now, as we finish, I wanna finish with, allow me to wet my whistle for a moment. I want to finish with my favorite general store. It's in a chapter called The Unsinkables, and that gives you some clue. 
The reason that this is my favorite general store, the one I'm going to share with you now and finish the talk with, is not because it's significantly different in any physical way with any of the other stores we've talked about. It doesn't look particularly different. As you'll see, the Putney store in Putney, Vermont, doesn't look significantly different than any other general store we've talked about or any other general store anywhere, really. It doesn't sell anything that's particularly different. It sells much of the same stuff that any general store sells. The reason, the reason that the Putney store is my favorite general store is because it is an underdog. It really shouldn't be here. Not because many people wouldn't be crushed if it wasn't here. They would be. They have been. It's an underdog because it had to fight back. It had to essentially come back from the dead, literally, to find a way to be reborn. Not once, but twice. Now, the first time, and as you'll see, it looked very much the same all through its history, right? hundred years apart, and there it is. The first time the Putney General Store, which has occupied the same place for over 200 years, just above Little Sackett's Brook in the center of Putney there, the first time the store had to fight back from almost going away was a terrible night in early May 2008 when a fire broke out on the third floor of the store. Thank goodness for volunteer fire departments because they were able to muster very quickly. They were able to get to the store. And although it looks bad, they were able to save essentially two thirds of the store. That's the good news. The bad news is that the owners had no insurance and they decided to take the building as a loss, write it off as a total loss, and they left town, leaving the little town of Putney to figure out what to do with their now half destroyed general store, which now had no owner and no means of reopening. And our friend, Lisa Papazian of the Historical Society, she called up our dear departed friend. Paul Brun of the Preservation Trust, you'll remember, and Paul came, this time came down to Putney and he surveyed the situation and he said, well, here's what has to happen. He said, the town has to buy the store because in my vast experience, as he put it, no one could argue with him, it's very difficult for a town to skip town. So he worked with them and they were able to arrange for the historical society, meaning the town of Putney, to take ownership of the store. He helped them write grants. He helped them find loans. He helped them find federal funding, state funding. School children that year all over Vermont raised money for the Putney store, and they were able to rebuild the Putney store. And all was whole again in Putney, Vermont, the little beating heart of Putney, Vermont. The general store was beating once again, and all was good. Are you ready to uh, have your heart broken just like they were in Putney? Boom. Only a year and a half later, fire broke out again at the Putney store, but this time there was no silver lining. This time the store burned down in less than 45 minutes. You know, even for a store that size, which is not huge, it takes some help to burn down like that in 45 minutes. And it had help. Investigators found traces of accelerant throughout the building, arson. So not only had the little town of Putney just experienced its second devastating fire in less than two years, this is a year and a half later from the first fire, but now they had to contend with the fact that not only had they lost their beloved store, but they lost it to arson. Meaning somebody, maybe your neighbor, might have done this. Who knows? That's the terror of arson. And it felt like a death in the family in Putney. People spoke about it like they had lost someone in their family. And in a sense, they had. Every family had a connection to the Putney store. And every family felt devastated in losing it. And Paul Brune came back down to Putney. And the Historical Society and Paul gathered early one morning. It was chilly. It was late December and they gathered outside the little stone church just opposite from where the store had stood. There was about 30, 40 people and word got out. It's a small town. Word got out that they were meeting at the store to talk about its future and what might be done. And within an hour or so, there were 100 people, then 150 people. They had to move outside into the cold, cold air. And after about an hour and a half or so, an older gentleman stood up on the low stone wall there and he said one thing. He said, look. 
I don't care about the rest of you. He said, I will be goddamned if I'm going to let an arsonist define my town. And Paul Broon kind of let this gentleman's words hang in the air for a moment. And then he stood up and he said, if I understand my esteemed friend correctly, I think we need to rebuild the store. And everybody agreed. And the one silver lining that did exist in the store was that it was such a heartbreak. It was such a tragic story. It made front page news all over the world, literally. There were pictures of the Putney fire on the front pages of the Perry Match magazine on Figaro. It, there were, it, it made the evening broadcasts of many major New England uh, national news, ABC News, NBC News Tonight. And money poured into Putney. More money than they needed to rebuild the store. And they were able to rebuild the store bigger and better. They still needed someone to run the store, right? Because the town owned it. They needed someone to run it. And luck smiled on Putney again. And they found a wonderful gentleman who had been a, a, a pharmacist. He was retired. And he had been an immigrant to Putney, he and his family, and he felt that he owed the town of Putney something because as he said, when we moved here and we didn't speak English and we didn't know anybody, we felt like the store took us in. We felt like people accepted us here because of the store. That's where we felt we were accepted. And I wanna give something back. He said, if I can run my pharmacy from the second floor, third floor of the store, I won't take a dime. And that's what he did. He hung out his little shingle. You'll see it there under the store sign. And now all was good once again in Putney until New Year's Day, 2017. No fire, no fire this time, but another tragedy. This lovely gentleman died. And neither of his two adult children wanted to come back to Putney to run a store. And the store closed again. But this time, Paul Bruin got the jump on Putney. And he called up Lisa Papazian. He said, Lisa, you've got to reopen the store. She said, Paul, what do you want me to do? We don't have anybody to run the store. He said, Lisa, you've got to reopen the store. The longer you stay closed, the longer it will be before you reopen. Trust me, I know, I've seen it happen. People find workarounds and all of a sudden, they don't even know when you've reopened because they no longer drive by the store. They've now gone somewhere else to do their dry cleaning or to buy a coffee and they're gone. He said, how many people do you have in the historical society now? She said, about 40, 41. He said, fine. He said, put everybody to work one hour a week and get that store open. And she did. And today, the Putney store is reopened. It reopened full time last summer. They have someone now running the store full time. It is truly about perseverance, as Paul put it so well. May he rest in peace in Putney. And as I finish, two quick things. One, a little bit of, 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 of sober reality. You know, we've been talking about saving general stores, but the, the cold hard reality is that general stores still close to the tune of about 20 to 25 every year in New England. And there wouldn't be any left at all if they weren't also being saved at the same time. But, you know, a quick rest in peace. You know, probably the most famous store in New England to close was in 2012 in Adamsville, Rhode Island, when Gray's closed. And when Gray's closed in 2012, eight years ago, it was at that time the longest continuously operating general store in American history. 224 years, just about 20 years less than the country had been in business. And even perhaps more poignantly, in the Berkshires. So you, you see that little died 2017. That's a page from my book. This photograph is a page from my book. Because when the book went to the publisher just before 2017, the Monterey General Store is alive and well. Today, it's gone. And these stores will continue to close if it weren't for one single thing, the new breed of general store owners. And I like to finish my talk by you know, throwing a little shout out at this new breed of general store owners because without them, eventually there would be no more general stores. And the remarkable thing I always like to point out about many, not all, but many of the new breed of general store owners is how young they are. Many of them are millennials, which means in and around 30 years old. And no knock on millennials, but what surprises me continually is that, is that, you know, these are folks, this is a generation, first generation to come fully of age with the internet, first generation to come fully of age with cell phones. This is a generation that I would think that would not have the same 
passion about brick and mortar experiences that say their parents or their grandparents have. But many of these, many of these new general store owners do, people like in Whitefield, Maine, people like Ben and Taryn Marcus. Ben and Taryn Marcus, you're looking at two people who never in their wildest dreams thought they'd ever own a general store. They're farmers. They met at agriculture school in Washington State. Ben's family was from Whitefield, Maine. So when they graduated, they moved back. They had hoped to be able to put their money together and, and maybe buy a few acres of land to farm. Farmland, very expensive in, in central Maine, very expensive. They couldn't even afford an acre. They couldn't even afford an acre. And after they'd been trying to find something for about a year and a half, a fellow came up to them one day in town and he said, you know, I know you guys are looking for some land. He said, I'll tell you what, I will give you, give you five acres of prime organic farmland. And they looked at him and they said, probably the same thing you would say. What's the catch? And he said, oh, yes, the catch. He said, the catch is, he said, the catch is, there is an old general store, Sheep's Get General, on the property. I've always hoped that maybe I would reopen it. I don't think that's going to happen. But he said, if you will reopen the store, keep it running for five years, the land is yours. And they still deliberated. That's how much they didn't want to run a general store. In fact, they, they decided, you know, let's just buy stuff for the store that we like, okay? That way, because they wanted the farmland, they wanted the farm. But they said, you know what, when the store goes belly up, we'll at least be able to liquidate the inventory, especially the food. We won't have to go food shopping for a year and a half, you know. Uh, but that didn't happen. Didn't happen. Oh, the lamb produced all right. Incredible organic produce, carrots the length of forearm. And people started arriving at six o'clock every Friday morning just to buy their produce. So a farm was reborn and a store was reborn. Then a cafe was born where they were now selling their own produce in the store. Now people, they were, they were, they were cooking breakfast, they were cooking lunch, and now people were, were, were showing up at six o'clock every single morning. And now Ben and Taryn just started doing things with the store that nobody had ever done with a general store. Wine tastings, open mic nights, childcare, yoga classes. And now the Sheepskit General Store became a wonderful new center of the community for young families again, for older folks again. And it gave hope. It gave hope, like the reopening of Hope General Store did in 2017 in May, that because of this new breed of general store owners, it gives hope that these wonderful centers of community, these third places in American life, these general stores will still live. And that is New England's general stores. So thank you very much. Um, I get, no, I'm going to stay. Um, and I will be happy to uh, answer any questions if you have. You know what I'm going to do? I hope you, anybody who's had a question has had a chance to uh, go on to chat and to, uh, to jot down a question or two, which we'll take now. Um, and I will also put up, if you're interested in buying a book, I'm going to leave this up here um, while, we, while, we, while we do some questions. If you're interested in buying a book, Yes, very, couldn't be easier to get one, even though uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not here in person where normally I would have my books on a table right now. Super easy, um, 22 bucks. And I'm going to tell you what you can get from me that you can't get from Amazon, which is you can get your copy signed by the author, author and you can get your copy shipped to you for free. Okay. Uh, and all you're going to need to do is send me an email. You just send me an email, say, Ted, I want to buy the book, uh, and I will tell you exactly how to do it and get it shipped back to you for free, super easy. And there are my two email addresses, tedreinstein at gmail.com or Ted, Ryan, Ted at tedreinstein.com. Now, Carol, to the questions. Okay, Hi. we have uh, Judy, Judy Blachick here from the Judy Friends. from the Friends of the Library. She'll Hi, Judy. will be asking the question. Hello. All right. We have a few questions in the All chat. Right. Uh, I have one in the chat, a few in the Q&A, and some from me. Um, right. Let's see. Over time, what kinds of products have come and gone in the general store? For example, has ice cream and candy always been offered? And that is from Rich C. Rich, great question. That's a great question. Yes. 
Um, what is offered in general stores has changed significantly. Now, some of that would have happened no matter what the store, whether it was general or department store, right? Because things change over time. But here's the biggest change. Here's the biggest change in terms of what general stores sell, especially when it comes to food. Up until, say, the 1960s, general stores were heavy about hardware and light on food. You could get coffee often at a general store, but generally, believe it or not, um, that was about it. You could buy groceries, um, but they were heavy on hardware. Here's the biggest change. Hardware has been swapped out for food. Today, there isn't a general store owner anywhere in New England who would tell you different. A general store can't survive today unless you offer not just food, but like decent food, meaning like a good deli, great sandwiches, maybe breakfast, right? Um, you can't survive without that today. The margins are so thin. And so they swapped out the hardware. Nobody's coming to the general store for a sledgehammer, Rich. I'm sure you'd agree. Uh, nobody's coming to the general store for hardware anymore because they're going to go to the big box stores for that. That's true. General stores are happy to cede that to the big box stores. You know what you can't get at Home Depot or Lowe's? You can't tarry over a nice breakfast sandwich uh, with a neighbor. And that's, what, that's, that's the biggest change in what they sell. General stores today, almost to a store in New England, have really, really good like food now, not just groceries, actually good food. That's the biggest change. Next question. Uh, I have a question from, from me. Well, first of all, I want to tell you, I laughed out loud sitting in my office here. So thank you for that. I'm oh, sure my pleasure. it would have been, you know, so much more fun for you to hear the responses. And yeah, it really, I guess. I, Judy, it's, 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 yeah. I did, I, it's amazing how much you missed that, but we'll yeah. get back to that. We'll have that again. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is great, but uh, I just wanted you to know I, yep. I was laughing over here. Thank you. Um, so how many generations of, of families can usually, you know, hang on and maintain the store? Is there, is there mm. a, like an average or anything like that? Good question. So I can't tell you. I, I just don't have that figure. I can't tell you what the average is. I can tell you from my own kind of empirical sense, having visited between 45 and 50 general stores, I can tell you my own sense. My own sense is that it's rare. It's become much more rare that multi-generations are running a store. Now, one of the stores on the front cover, uh, it uh, actually, it's, <laughs> believe it or not, that's not, <laughs> that's not the cover, that's not the final cover. It's the, it's the cover that I prefer, but the, 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 the final cover that the publisher put out is, is this one right here. And on this cover, which you would get if you bought the book. So this is the Jericho uh, Center General Store. The Jericho General Store is, is one of those rare general stores where multi-generations, two, two going on three generations are running the store there now. It's really rare now to find general stores where you can find multi-generation more than that. Um, it was true, of course, in the last store I can think of where that was true in terms of, of decades and decades was, um, was the store that's on the front cover in the, the graphic right here, Shrewsbury, uh, the Pierce's. That's the last general store I can think of, at least of those that I visited, where the generation, multi-generations go back decades. The only, only one I can think of now, right off the top of my head, uh, that goes back even two or three generations uh, is is Jericho Vermont? Okay, I, I uh, we have a question in the chat itself. Well, actually, that's where people are putting questions. So let's look at that. Do we know the oldest surviving general store in New Hampshire? Yes, that's from Sandy. Yes, you know, <laughs> I'll just say parenthetically, Sandy. You know, as you know. Uh, if you're a New Englander, if you spend any time here, you probably guess it even if you're not. That, uh, you know, those kinds of things, the oldest, um, the oldest continuously operating of anything. Uh, Judy and I were talking before we started tonight about the oldest post office, continuously operating post office in America is in New Hampshire. A lot of old things in New Hampshire is in Hilldale, right? Hilldale, Hillsdale. Hillsdale, yep. Hillsdale, New Hampshire, right. So. That, that's a very competitive area 
anytime you're talking about the oldest. So I'm going to preface my answer by telling you that there are, even as I say this, there are stores that would say, oh, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. And not just in New Hampshire, but in Massachusetts and in Vermont. However, um, I'm comfortable saying that the oldest general store, not only in New Hampshire, but in New England, is up on the north, north shore of Lake Winnipesaukee in Moultonboro, the Moultonboro General Store. Hmm. There's been a general store going on there now for well over 200 years. Um, and while today it's not the sort of third place, you know, there, there, there aren't a lot of locals that spend a lot of time in the Moultonboro General Store. I mean, they run in every now and then. It's much more popular, you know, with summer le fall leaf peepers and tourists. That's okay. I always say, listen, the original store is still standing and it's still running as a general store. That's good enough for me, but I, I'm going to say Moulton Bar. Okay. I have a, a nice remembrance here from Pam McGrath. Uh, as a kid, we would walk to the general store to get our mail. Our reward was a chance to buy penny candy for the walk home. With the beginning of home delivery of our mail, the store really suffered. That was the kid meeting part of the community truly missing today. Mm -hmm. Now all the kid gatherings are organized and orchestrated. Too bad. That is too bad. Boy, I, I'll tell you, I, I, I mentioned much earlier in the talk about my own memory of riding my bike to the local store where I grew up in Winthrop and uh, very much the same. That's a wonderful reminiscence. Very much the same. And as far, you know, it's funny, as I think about it right now, uh, right off of your own recollection that you described so nicely, um, I have the same image and, you know, and the first thing I think about is the fact that anytime I would ride up, there would be other bikes, other kids bikes parked outside the store. Uh, and you just don't see that today, do you? You just don't. Kind of sad. Anyway, moving Someone on. Uh, named Sue has asked, are you a fan of Zebs in North Conway? Ah, Zebs. Yes. Um, so I certainly know Zebs. I certainly am familiar with Zebs. I love North Conway. Uh, really love North Conway. Um, I'm, I'm a long time, you know, lifelong skier. And of course, as you probably know, North Conway has a storied, you know, really legendary place in New England ski history because that's where one of the stops of the ski trains out of North Station in Boston stopped at that wonderful, still surviving train depot in the middle of North Conway. Zebs is, is, is an interesting case in point. Um, because Zebs, while it, it, it still functions today as, you know, Zebs General Store, um, similar to some extent to Moultonboro, it's no longer a third place. It's no longer a community gathering place where people, you know, people from the community gather um, and have a coffee and that sort of thing. Um, and it's much more geared now, as you probably know, to, to tourism and to souvenirs and that kind of merchandise. Again. Totally fine, totally fine. Um, it's a wonderful old place and it keeps alive for many people, that sense of a general store. That's okay, that's okay. But yes, very familiar with Zebs, very familiar with Zebs. Then I have a long question. Uh, Carol is, um, our Carol here on the, <laughs> on the panel, um, is from Connecticut. And she says, um, I grew up in Norwalk, Connecticut where there was a complex old McDonald's farm. Uh, she said it may have been in Darien, it was on the town line, uh, with old fashioned rides like carousel and hayride, a restaurant, a stream just with seals in it for some reason, uh, hopefully no sharks, but, um, and a general store with penny candy that we stocked up on for school field trip bus rides. Judy, can I stop you for one second? Sure. Did you say there was a stream with seals? Yeah, that's why I made the shark joke. Okay, because I have never heard of freshwater seals. Is anybody else? Mm, nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just checked it. it. She says, it was demolished in the 1970s. Did you ever learn anything Because about the seals that? probably died. Yeah, <laughs> so you need to find out about Old McDonald's Farm in Connecticut. You know what, Carol? I am writing that down. I'm writing that down right now. <laughs> Because that's the strangest, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard. And the first thing I'm going to try to find out is I'm going to try to solve the mystery of the seals in the stream at Old McDonald's. 
that's 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 the craziest that's the most interesting question i've ever been asked. i'm sorry i don't have an answer so congratulations a an answer to a long question wow <laughs> well i grew up in pennsylvania and there was a, a little general store um and honestly i don't even know if i realized it was a general store because i just went in to buy penny candy and the man there was the most patient man in the universe he was patient he, no patient he would wait and you would you know you had a nickel and you would look over everything and try to decide and he was so sweet so oh. mr hamlin's store was a wonderful wonderful general store oh. that's really nice that's really nice you know great little anecdote off of that uh that you, it came to mind when you talked about such a sweet patient store owner remember dan and wits in uh, in norwich mm -hmm. when you showed uh-huh so Dan's grandson, Dan Frazier, told me the funniest story. <laughs> Talk about patience. So he said that one day, his grandfather, when he was running the store, he said one day he noticed for sure that there were two little boys by the, by the ice cream freezer, and he noticed that one of them put a fudgicle in his pocket <laughs> and, and was proceeding to make his way out of the store. And Mr. And, and, and so Dan's grandfather intercepted him, didn't accuse him of anything. And he just said, hi, Jimmy, how are you? And you know, the kids are like, okay. And he said, so tell me what's going on at school these days. And how are your parents? And how's your sister? <laughs> Meanwhile, it's he melting. looked down and there was a telltale, <laughs> there was a telltale <laughs> fudgical street. <laughs> growing bigger the stain got bigger and bigger on this kid's poor jeans <laughs> and i'm sure the kid learned a lesson uh, but that, that took some real patience right <laughs> that's pretty funny <laughs> any well, other questions <laughs> i don't have anything queued up so uh um, right. i think we want to thank you so much this has been fascinating and fun and funny oh, um, thank you so carol you want to come on and do your spiel too. You're on mute, Carol. Can you see me? Now we can uh, hear you. Can hear you. Okay. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, remind them about the upcoming book sale again on Saturday from 10 to 2, and the Jamie Ford author of um, Hotel on the Corner and Bitter and Sweet in October. Uh, Ted, I really want to thank you. This was a lot of fun. And obviously, I have to do some fact checking about those seals. <laughs> but I'm, uh, it just, this is a it's, <laughs> it sounds like it was an amazing place. I, I'm, I'm just not sure I get the seals in the stream. But the stream I remember as being kind of dirty, but this is where I had my five year old birthday party. So <laughs> if my memory's failing me, um, I'm, I'll I, I <laughs> promise you, I am going to run that down and I will message you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Great. Well, thank, thank you. you. I listen. I I want to say from my end, uh, this was a real pleasure. Um, you know, it, 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 as I said at the beginning, I so wish I had been able to to be in, in Nashua in person yeah. tonight because I, I I love being in person and sharing. Uh, I, I love being in public libraries and I love mm -hmm. sharing with people who love public libraries and sharing good stories. So, um, but I'm glad we were able to do this. I really appreciate it and uh, mm -hmm. thank you very much to your friends. Of the public library, and uh, in uh, in a year, I have a, a a new book coming out, and I hope maybe we'll we'll do this again. Great, sounds great. great. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. Good night. <laughs>